your Bibles this morning and go to Exodus chapter number 20, the 20th chapter in the book of Exodus is where we'll find our text this morning. And of course, we are in a series in which we're preaching through some of the great chapters in the Bible and just kind of highlighting what's found there and doing what we can to draw out from uh, these chapters and from these particular verses things that will be helpful and encouraging to us in our daily walk. And the Word of God is such a powerful book, and we're thankful for everything uh, that is found here. I'd like for you, if you would, to look in Exodus chapter number 20. We'll read, begin reading in verse number 1, and uh, we'll read down through verse uh, verse number 10, uh, chapter number 20, verse number 1, the Bible says, And God spake all these words, saying, I am the Lord thy God, which have brought thee out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image, or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above, or that is in the earth beneath, or that is in the water under the earth. Thou shalt not bow down thyself to them, nor serve them, for I, the Lord thy God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children unto the third and fourth generation of them that hate me, and showing mercy unto thousands of them that love me and keep my commandments. Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless that taketh his name in vain. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days shalt thou labor and do all thy work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. In it thou shalt not do any work, thou nor thy son nor thy daughter, thy manservant nor thy maidservant nor thy cattle, nor thy stranger that is within thy gates. I know I said we'd only read through verse number 10, but let's go a little bit further. Verse number 11, for in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea and all that in them is, and rested the seventh day. Wherefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. Honor thy father and thy mother that thy days may be long upon the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee. Thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not bear false witness against thy neighbor, thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's house, thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's wife, nor his manservant, nor his maidservant, nor his ox, nor his ass, nor anything that is thy neighbor's. What we have just read, these 17 verses are commonly known or referred to as the Ten Commandments. And with the Lord's help, I'd like to preach to you a message here out of this 20th chapter, what I believe to be one of the great chapters in the Bible, in which we find contained for us the Ten Commandments that were given to the people of God and still certainly resonate in our hearts today. Father, we pray that you'd bless the reading of your word this morning. Thank you for the Bible. Lord, thank you for this guidebook, Lord, this now, this living book, literally, the Bible tells us that it is alive and that it is powerful and that it is sharp, uh, Lord, to divide our lives and to show us areas that we're wrong and how we can be right. We pray, Lord, that you would uh, bless us as we enter into this time together. Already, we've been encouraged and helped by the singing and by the testimony. And, uh, Lord, we're praying that the preaching would be more of the same, that it would draw us into a closer and deeper relationship with Thee. Lord, help us to come away from this service with a greater understanding of the purpose of the Ten Commandments. Lord, I, I pray that you would help me as I preach. Lord, would you fill me with your spirit? May I not stand in this pulpit before this congregation alone, but Lord, may you stand here with me, we pray in Jesus' name, amen. For 420 years, the children of Israel, they languished in, in bondage and in captivity. Uh, this period of captivity, it grew harder and more difficult with each and every passing year. In fact, the Bible tells us that the further Egypt was removed from a man by the name of Joseph and Joseph's leadership, the more, the more hostile they were to Israel's presence in their land. We read of that in Exodus chapter number 1, verses 8 through 14. However, in Exodus chapter number two, a young child was born. What was probably viewed by his parents and, and certainly by those in his community as an untimely birth. We've heard that, we've heard that phrase used in time past, but, but many would have viewed the birth of this little boy by the name of Moses as an untimely birth, and yet, and yet this child was the fulfillment of God's plan. Uh, he would eventually grow up to lead God's people out of captivity from the nation of Egypt. He would grow and eventually surrender to do what God called and created him for, 
And it was this same child that was born in Exodus chapter number two who oversaw the 10 plagues that God poured out upon Egypt before Pharaoh finally let the people leave to follow God to the promised land. The, the night they left Egypt was one of great joy and celebration. Can you imagine what that was, must have been like? I felt a little bit like that yesterday when I left the father-son camp out. I'm finally getting out of bondage and captivity. I get to go back to my bed, and I get to go back to my home and air conditioning. And uh, Anyways, I, I probably should not have thrown that in there. But anyways, you, you get the idea, right, that they're leaving, this, they're leaving this place of bondage and captivity, and it was such an exciting evening, and yet... And yet there was still much growing and stretching that God had in front of them. A few days, literally a few days removed from, from Egypt and from leaving this place in this night of great celebration and great blessing, they would find themselves trapped at the Red Sea. And it was at the Red Sea that they would begin to wonder and, and even begin to murmur and complain, God, have you, have you done all of this? Have you brought us out of captivity just to slay us here in this wilderness? We read of their words in Exodus chapter 14 and verses 10 to 12. The Bible says that Pharaoh drew nigh, and at that point the children of Israel lifted up their eyes, and behold, the Egyptians marched after them. And of course, you know, the Red Sea was in front of them, and they had no boats, and they had no way to, uh, to cross this Red Sea. And, and, and all that separated them from the Egyptian army behind them was a pillar of cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night. The Bible says that at that point, they lifted up their voices and they said unto Moses, because there were no graves in Egypt, hast thou taken us away to die in the wilderness? Wherefore hast thou dealt thus with us to carry us forth out of Egypt? Is not this the word that we did tell thee in Egypt, saying, let us alone that we may serve the Egyptians? For it had been better for us to serve the Egyptians than that we should die in the wilderness you see how quickly God's people reverted back to complaining and to murmuring, believing that this would be the place where they would die. Of course, as he had done to bring them out of Egypt, God miraculously intervened. You know that story. And he created a path for them. Think about that. Created a path for them to cross through the midst of the sea. And I'm reminded that oftentimes when we come to trials and obstacles and difficulty, God does not, he oftentimes does not pick us up and place us on the other side of that thing, nor, nor does he remove the obstacle altogether. But, but many times, here's what God does, God creates a path through the obstacle. God allows us to, uh, to walk through it, and you can imagine as they walked through that Red Sea and the water was high on both sides, and they thought at any moment, at any moment, all of this could collapse upon us and we could die and yet every step was a step of faith in an almighty God and God led them through the, through the Red Sea on dry ground. And I reminded that a month and a half after that, and after they're, they're leaving the, uh, the, the nation of Egypt, the Bible says that they came to another challenging time. In Exodus chapter number 16, they again began to murmur and complain. You think, you would think they would have, they would have learned a lesson or two, wouldn't you? I mean, God had miraculously intervened and led them out of Egypt, and then God created a path through the Red Sea for them to cross on dry ground. And now, all of a sudden, here they are again, and their bellies are beginning to rumble a little bit with hunger, and, and, and there's, no, there's no fields from which to harvest, and there's no fruit trees from which to gather fruit, and, and they have some cattle, but, but they're probably thinking we need to ration some of this out, and, and, uh, and they began to complain again. Exodus chapter number 16, they began to murmur, Moses, did you, did you bring us here to cause us to starve to death in the wilderness? And of course, you know the rest of the story. God instructed Moses that tomorrow morning, when your people get up, they're going to find something on the ground. They're going to find some food that I have sent their way to fill their bellies. And, and of course, for the rest of the time that they were in the wilderness wanderings, they would enjoy something known as manna. Why? Because God prepared and he furnished a table for them in the wilderness and their bellies were filled. This fledgling nation the nation of, of Israel, they, they have a clear leader, don't they? His name is Moses. And they have achieved independence and freedom, haven't they? They're no longer under the bondage of the nation of Egypt. 
they're now their own country and and they're and they're moving even they even have a they even have a plot of land that God has promised to give to them I mean they have all of the markings all of the makings of a sovereign nation they have a leader and and they have freedom and they have a land that they're heading towards but they're missing something aren't they there's still a missing piece and that missing piece is they, they have really no law by which to govern themselves. However, because this nation is different, they will not organize themselves in a normal way like we often think of through the democratic process. There would, be, there would be no debating as to, well, should we include this law or should we not include this law? And there would, at this point in time, there would, be no, there would be no vote taken or received as to who is going to serve as a representative or as a, as a leader. There would, be, uh, there would be no committees on which people would serve. And, well, I'm in charge of transportation. I'm going to be in charge of, uh, uh, of defense. And I'm going to be in charge of education. No, none of that existed. Why? Because this was a nation that was different than all other nations these are the people of God. And because God had designed this nation, and he had chosen them, and he had delivered them, and he had provided for their needs over and over again, and he was going to give them the land that they were going to receive, it would be God, it would be God who would write their laws, and God who would determine how it was that they were going to live. And so three months removed from their Egyptian exodus, very early on during the wilderness wanderings that I believe were supposed to last only about a year in length. But because of their disobedience and because of their lack of faith, the wilderness wanderings would last much longer than that. It would be 39 more years that they would wander in the wilderness. But three months removed from, from Egypt, God came down and God gave 10 specific laws or commands for the children of Israel to abide by. Here, here they are. They're broken down for us in Exodus chapter number 20. And if you're studying this, you'll find that they're broken down in, into two separate categories. The first four deal with man's relationship with God. And we see them very clearly. They're listed for us in verses 3 through verse number 8. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Verse number 4, thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image. Verse number seven, thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain. And then verse number eight, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. And so the first four commandments that are given by God to his people deal with their obligations and their responsibilities to him. These are his expectations for them. The final six are discovered in beginning in verse number 12 and contained all the way through verse number 17. And these final six deal with man's relationship with fellow men. They are, honor thy father and thy mother. Verse number 12, thou shalt not kill. Verse number 13, thou shalt not commit adultery. Verse number 14, thou shalt not steal. Thou shalt not bear false witness. And thou shalt not covet. Now you probably would not be familiar with this, but if you'll read, beginning really from this passage and really reading through the remainder of the first five books of the Old Testament, you will find, you will find that there's actually a whole lot more laws than just 10. In fact, those who have studied this and Bible scholars have counted all of the laws that God gave to his people, and you'll discover that there are actually 613 laws by which God expected his people to live and to, to abide by. These 10 are in many respects sort of a, an encapsulation of the 613 because very few people are going to be, be able to remember 613 laws. That's almost impossible for them to keep track of that and to, and to remember that. But, but, but most people can remember 10, can't they? Here's what's interesting is Jesus comes on the scene and he has a man that comes to him. The Bible says there in Matthew chapter number 22 and the man has sinister motives. He's trying to, he's trying to trip up Jesus in his teaching and in his, and in his, and in his, uh, in his speaking. And he says, he, says, he says, Jesus, what is the great commandment in the law? And you know what Jesus did? God, God took the 613 and he, and, he, and, he, and he narrowed them down to 10. And Jesus, Jesus being God took the 10 and he narrowed them down to two. He said, what's the great commandment in the law? And Jesus said, the, the first and the great commandment is love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all of your strength. Jesus says that's number one. That's the first four. That's man's relationship or responsibilities to God Almighty. 
is to love God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, with all of your mind, with all of your strength. That, that's the first four. Thou shalt have no other gods before thee. Thou shalt make any great revenge. Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain and remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. And then Jesus took it a step further. He had not been asked what the second great commandment was, but that's not a problem because the second great commandment is the final six. And that is this, and thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Love your neighbor as yourself, you won't lie to him. You love your neighbor as yourself, you, you're not gonna covet what he has. You love your neighbor as yourself and you're certainly not gonna kill him, are you? No, no the final six are the, are, are the second element. That is to love your neighbor as you love yourself. And I believe, of course, Exodus 20 which contains the first revealing of these commandments is one of the great chapters in all of the Bible. Here's what, I, here's what I find. Just as the devil came in and messed up God's perfect paradise and God's creation early on, isn't it interesting, isn't it really not all that surprising to see that the devil has done the same here with the Ten Commandments? The devil has misled many into believing that that in keeping of these commandments, there is some form of salvation. There is some form of eternal life. But can I say that this misunderstanding, just because people think that, does not negate the truth that is given in this text. It does not give us a release from talking about it and from teaching and preaching what the Bible actually has to say. And therefore, I'd like for us together this morning to consider three great truths that I believe the Lord has given as I have studied this particular passage of Scripture. Number one, I want to say this, and you can follow along there in your bulletin if you'd like. Number one, I think we discover in this text that God has the authority to establish laws for life and for living. That God has the authority to establish laws for life and living. We see that in verses one and two. Now the Lord, before he gives these laws, he has systematically, he has begun to reveal himself to his people. In fact, if you were to re read the preceding chapter, we don't have time to go back there, but if you were to take some time to read through Exodus chapter number 19, you would discover that God had prepared Moses who was supposed to turn around and prepare the people for the giving of these commandments. In fact, God gave, God gave Moses a three-day lead time. And he said to Moses, he said, listen, in three days I'm coming down there and I am gonna give some things to you and to the people. And before, before we do that, I want, you to, I want you to sanctify the people. That means to set apart the people or to prepare the people for, for their interaction with me. Here were some of the things that they were supposed to do. They were, they were to be sanctified by washing their clothes according to Exodus 19 and verse number 10. In other words, God said, I don't want you to meet with me with clothes that have not been completely and thoroughly washed. I only want you to, I want, I want to come down and I want to commune with you, but only if you're wearing clean and fresh garments. They were, during, those, during that three-day period, they were to completely avoid uh, the place where God's presence would be, a place known as Mount Sinai. In other words, there was, a, there was an imaginary sort of line that was drawn around that mountain, and God said, I don't want any man to approach this place. I don't want any man's feet to step foot on this mountain because this mountain is going to be holy. It is the place where my presence is going to abide. And so you've got three days to stay away from this mountain completely altogether. The final thing that God instructed them is found in verse number 15, and that was this. He said, he said that they were to refrain from marital activity with their wives, according to chapter number 19 and verse number 15. God says, I want you to be pure. I want you to be clean. I, 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 I want you to be not thinking along those lines. I want you to be thinking about me. And when God came down on that third day, and he began to inhabit a presence on Mount Sinai. The Bible says that there was thunder and that there was lightning, that there was a thick cloud. There was the noise of an exceedingly loud trumpet in verse number 16. And there was a great earthquake that shook the Mount Sinai there according to verse number 18. And the Bible says that at the sight of these things, when these events transpired, that the people began to tremble in fear and in awe and in wonder over God and over his presence there. There is no doubt, there is no doubt in my mind that all of this was being done to demonstrate God's power and his authority and his superiority over them. And can I say that God's authority to establish laws for life and living are very clearly revealed in this text. 
In fact, we find them specifically in verse number two, where we discover that God has the authority to establish laws for life and living because of, number one, his position. Because of his position. Would you look in verse number two, where God says, I am the Lord thy God. I am the Lord thy God. There's three, there's three elements to this, this identification that God gives of his position and who he is. And I want you to consider them with me. I don't know about you, but when I read the Old Testament, I'm especially taken by that phrase, I am. That's a significant phrase, isn't it? It's a significant phrase because just a few chapters prior, it became, it became really the identifying mark for Moses' authority to go back to Egypt and to tell the Hebrew people, hey, God has sent me here to lead you out. We read of that in Exodus chapter number three, verses 13 and 14, where the Bible says that Moses said unto God, well, when I, when I come unto the children of Israel and say unto them, the God of your fathers has sent me unto you, and they shall say to me, what is his name? You, you're familiar with that, aren't you? What shall I say unto them? God replied and said unto Moses, I am that I am. And he said, thus shalt thou say unto the children of Israel, I am have sent me unto you. Don't you suppose that that I am, that phrase became quite significant to the children of Israel? And here is God referring to himself as I am. That's who I am, I am. And then he goes on a step further. He says, I am the Lord. Now there's a key, there's a key spelling of the Lord there that you'll find in your text. Do you see it there? You'll find this quite a bit throughout the Old Testament. And I want to help you understand what this means. The, the word Lord is all capitalized, if you hadn't noticed that already. Every, every letter of the word is capitalized. This is significant. You see, this is the Hebrew word Jehovah, and it is the most hallowed and revered of all of God's names. Here, here's what it, it speaks of. It speaks of God being the self-existent or the eternal one. I've done some studying of the scribes, and the scribes, of course, were those who were responsible for taking the originals and, and copying the originals onto new papers as the originals got older and they began to fade. They did not have the technology that we have available to us today. You could not upload it onto a computer digitally and save it there. And so you had to keep copying, keep copying, keep copying. And I'm given to understand that the Hebrew scribes, every time they would come to the word Lord, when it's all capitalized, they'd come to that word Jehovah, or, or, or might even say Yahweh, the, the, that I'm given to understand that they had, a, they had a, a certain way of doing things, that they would push away from where they were writing, and that they would go and they would take off their garments and they would completely wash their body. And then they would put on a fresh garment to wear and they would take a new pen and dip it in fresh ink before they would ever write that word. It was so holy to them. Those were some of the steps that they took so as not to approach that word in a casual or a haphazard manner. And if you read through your Bible, you will find that word over and over and over and over again. That's a lot of showers. <laughs> That's a lot of fresh garments. That's, that's a lot of fresh ink and new pens. But they, they felt like it was worth it. They felt like it was necessary be, because of the holiness and the grandeur of that name. And so there's several identifying marks here. I am. That's significant. I am the Lord. I am Jehovah. I am Yahweh. I am the eternal one. I am the self-existent one. But then he notice, notice that he finishes it by saying, I am the Lord thy God. I'm your God. Is he, is he your God today? He, he says you, you shall not have any other gods before me. It is possible, it is possible, isn't it, for us to lift up other things in our lives as gods. He says, I am the Lord, thy God. In other words, in, in other words listen, if he's your God, if you've accepted him in that role in your life, then doesn't he have the right to determine how you live? The things that you do, the places that you go, the words that you say, the people that you spend your time, what you do with your money, if he is your God. You see, you see there's lots of children here in, 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 in this church, and uh, I'm not their father. I'm father to four. And sometimes I'll, I'll walk up to a child and say, hey, straighten up, and that kid looks at me like, you know, who are you, buzz off, you know. And I suppose, I suppose they can do that because I'm not their dad. But if I come up to one of my kids and I say straighten up, and they say buzz off, we're gonna have a meeting. <laughs> We're going to get together. And if God comes to you and God speaks into your life and God says, hey, straighten up, 
hey, live like this, hey, abide by these laws, abide by these rules, then you and I, listen, we have an obligation. If he's our God, he sits in that position, then he has the authority, doesn't he? He has the authority to write laws for our life and for our living. And by the way, we find those laws in this book. This book becomes the guidebook for our lives because of his position. And can I say, not only does God give, not only does God give the laws for life and living, but he also has the ability, not just to give them, but also to hold us accountable. Stop to think about that for just a moment. What is found in this book, it may not be all that significant to you at this point in time, but a day is coming. A day is coming in which you will stand before God. And in that day, in that day, if you've been careless, if you've been haphazard with God's laws for life and living, you will wish in that moment, you will wish in that moment that you had been more careful because you will stand before God someday and you will give an account because he doesn't have just the authority to give the laws for life and living, but he also has the authority to hold us accountable. But notice secondly, not only his position, but his provision. Look what he says. He says, I am the Lord thy God, which have brought thee out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. God says, I'm getting ready to tell you what to do. I'm gonna tell you what, what I expect out of you. I'm gonna give you some responsibility, some laws for life and living. And I can do that because of who I am. I am the Lord. I am the eternal one. I am the self-existent one. And I am your God. I'm not just some random God out somewhere. No, 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 you have accepted me as your God. You have followed me to this point. Therefore, I have the right. Not only do I have the right because of who I am, but I have the right because of what I have done. He says, look what I've done. He says, I led you out of captivity. I led you out of the house of bondage. You were in Egypt. You were nothing but slaves. But because of me, because of my intervention, because I stepped in and I delivered you, therefore I have the right, I have the authority because of my provision. Again, God's authority to establish laws for life and living is based on his position, but it's also based upon his provision can I say that no further thing is needed for us to heed and obey, but when we consider what it is that he has done for us and who it is that he actually is. When we consider those two things, then and only then will we, will we agree to abide by the laws for life and living that he's given to us in his word. Notice there's a second thought that I'd like to point out to you is not only that God has the authority to give us laws for life and living, but secondly, can I say that these laws, as you study your Bible, these laws serve, number two, a specific purpose. These laws serve a specific purpose. I know what you're thinking, and many people would be thinking this. The vast majority probably of people that live in our neighborhoods and, and even are attending churches in our communities today, they would say, oh, I know what the specific purpose is. These are, these are God's expectations for us to live by, and if we live by these things, then we can go to heaven. Yeah, I get it. That's the purpose for the Ten Commandments. And I wanted to share two thoughts along those lines. Number one, I want to say, first of all, that these, these commandments cannot be kept by any man. These, these laws, these commandments cannot be kept by any man. Here's why. The Bible says in Ecclesiastes 7 and verse number 20 that there is not a just man upon the earth. There's not a just man upon earth that doeth good and sinneth not. He doesn't exist. You can look all over the place. Some of you know some pretty good people. But you spend enough time with them and you'll find that every once in a while they're lifted up with pride just like you are. Every once in a while, they get angry just like you get angry. Every once in a while, they lose their temper just like you lose your temper. Or maybe every once in a while, they'll, they'll say something that is a half-truth or something that is deceitful designed to, uh, to sort of mislead someone. And, and you'll, you'll discover, you spend enough time with people, you'll discover that there is not a just man upon earth. You spend enough time with people, you'll discover that the Bible is true. The Bible says in Romans 3.10, as it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. There's not a single righteous man on the earth. That includes the preacher. That includes the missionary. That includes the evangelist. That includes the prophets who gave us this book through in divine inspiration and inspiration of the Holy Spirit of God. They recognize and acknowledge that they were sinners by nature as well. Galatians 3.22 says, but the scripture hath concluded all under sin James 3, 2, for in many things we offend all in 1 John 1, 8. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth 
is not in us. You know what the Bible says? The Bible says you, you find the guy who says, I've never sinned, and you'll, you'll discover that he's kidding himself. Worse yet, he's deceiving. He's lying to himself. There's no such thing. There's no such thing as a man who has, who has no sin. And when we read these things, we are a bit overwhelmed, aren't we? We're overwhelmed with our guilt at, at breaking so many of them over and over again. We're overwhelmed with the thought that we are completely unable to ever arrive at a point where we keep every one of these laws for a moment of time, much less a lifetime. What man or woman do you know who can claim that they've never lied? Who can claim that they've never stolen? Who can claim that they've never coveted, wanted something, lusted after something that was not their own? What man or, you, what man or woman do you know who claims that they've never dishonored their parents? You won't find anybody. They don't exist. What man or woman can ever claim to have never allowed another God to come before the one true God in their own lives. The point is this, we are all guilty. We are all, every last one of us, are all guilty of living life so far below the standards given here. And so, we think about these laws and the fact that they serve a specific purpose, we must acknowledge, number one, that these laws cannot be kept by any man. Some of you, again, as we came to this, this thought, you immediately thought to yourself, well, yeah, I know what the purpose is. The purpose is that, that, that we could do the things that are found here, and by doing these things, then we can, we can earn our way to heaven. And it's pretty obvious, isn't it? It's pretty obvious that there's not a single person who can go five minutes, 10 minutes, maybe an hour, keeping all of these, much less a day, a week, a month, a year, a lifetime. They cannot be kept by any man. Notice, secondly, here, here really is the purpose they are given, number two, to bring us to faith in Christ. That, that's the purpose of the Ten Commandments. That they're given by God to bring us to faith in Christ. Now stay with me here for just a moment because it does not specifically or explicitly say that here in this text. In other words, in Acts chapter, or excuse me, Exodus chapter number 20, as we read these, it doesn't say, now these are given to bring you to faith in Christ. But if you'll read the totality of the Bible, you'll read the whole thing, you will find that over time, these laws uh, serve a purpose uh, to build a case to bring us to faith in Christ. Now I want you to hold your place in Exodus 20, and I want you to join me in Galatians chapter number three. Galatians chapter number three. And I want you to see what the Bible says here in Galatians chapter 3 and in verse number 24. Would you look there with me? For those of you who do not have a Bible, you can find it on the screen in front of you. Galatians 3 and verse number 24. The Bible says this, Wherefore the law was our schoolmaster. For what purpose? To bring us unto Christ. That we might be justified by faith. The law was our schoolmaster to bring us unto Christ that we might be justified by faith. Now, now schoolmaster is just another, it's just a fancier word for teacher, instructor. You sat in school and, and, and uh, many of you, most of you probably completed, at the very least, you completed maybe a high school diploma. Some of you went even further and got a, a college degree and some of you maybe even further than that, doctors, PhD, whatever the case might be, or master's. You understand that you sat through the classes and you listened to the teacher and you gained some level of understanding of the subject, enough at least to pass the class. That was the schoolmaster, that was the teacher. The schoolmaster might have taught you of history, might have taught you some English and grammar, might have taught you some science. The schoolmaster might have taught you some math, some of the more complex things. That was the job that they had. And Paul, Paul here, under inspiration of the Holy Ghost, he writes that the law, the Ten Commandments, the laws that are given for life and living, these things are our schoolmaster, they're our teacher. And what does the teacher do? The teacher brings us to a better understanding of how much we need Christ. That was the purpose of the Ten Commandments. In, in Romans chapter number three and verse number 20, Paul writes, therefore by the deeds of the law, there shall no flesh be justified in his sight, for by the law is the knowledge of sin. So God already tells you there in Romans chapter number three, you cannot be justified by, by, by working out the law. It's impossible. Can't be done. So if, if, if these laws are, are, are given to us and they do not, they do not, justifies well what do they do 
It's a good question, isn't it? What's the purpose of these things? If they don't get us to the front of the line, if they don't get us to heaven, if they don't get us to eternal life, then what is the purpose? Here's the purpose. The law is given to help us know just how much of a mess our lives are really in. Paul would later write in Romans chapter 7, in verse number 7, he'd say, What shall we say then? Is the law sin? God forbid, nay, I had not known sin but by the law. So, so let me take it a step further. Here, here's what he says the law is. He says the law, in, in essence, is, a, is like a mirror. And it helps me to see all the flaws that I have. You ever looked in a mirror? And you looked at that mirror and you, you thought to yourself, it can't be. <laughs> can't be that I'm this ugly, right? Can't be that I have this many gray hairs. Can't be that my nose is this long or that my eyes are this color. Or, can't be can't be it is it is that mirror helps and then and we can fix some things looking in that mirror can't we you know as I see the hair okay if I comb it this way maybe look a little bit better see the face and I see that I've got some gray hairs and places on my face that I so I can just shave all of those off and no one will know put a little bit of put a little bit of dye in that hair and, and we're and we're good to go no one will know that I'm aging and that I'm getting older about those wrinkles, I can't help you with that. That's, it is what it is, right? But that mirror, it, it reveals, listen, it reveals who I really am. Paul, Paul looked in this mirror, the mirror of the law, and listen to the conclusion he came to in Romans chapter seven and verse number 24. Here's the conclusion. He looks in the mirror and he said this. He said, oh, wretched man that I am. Now, no, 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 stay with me for a minute. Isn't it just like the devil? Isn't it just like the devil to take the thing that God intended to be the mirror to show us how desperately we need to Christ, what a wretch we are? And isn't it just like the devil to take that same thing and to convince man that instead he looks at that list of things in Exodus chapter 20, and instead of saying, oh, wretch that I am, he says, look what I can do. The vast, listen, the vast majority of religious people in our world today take this mirror that is supposed, to, is supposed to determine and to show us just how much of a mess we are, and they take this mirror and they say, look what I can do. And until, listen, until you come to the point where you stop saying, look what I can do, and you start saying, oh, wretched man that I am, you cannot be saved because you cannot save yourself. You cannot do enough good works. You must come to a point where you behold these 10 laws that are given and you proclaim with all of your might as Paul did, oh, wretched man that I am, I can hardly go a day without lying. I can hardly go a day without coveting or without lusting. I can hardly go a day without dishonoring my parents and my authority figures. I can hardly go a day without having another God in front of me that I'm worshiping and that I'm serving over the true God of the universe. Universe. What a wretch! What a mess I am. Paul preached in Acts 13, verses 38 and 39, that justification, listen, being right with God is never found by keeping the law, but it is instead found by believing in Him. He says in, in verse number 38, Be it known unto you, therefore, men and brethren, that through this man, he's speaking of Jesus, is preached unto you the forgiveness of sins, and by him all that believe are justified from all things from which he could not be justified. You could not be justified by the law of Moses. If you read these commandments and you find yourself despairing over the wretch you are, then there's hope. There's hope. If you read these commandments and you find yourself lifted up with pride, oh, how good you are, you're in a worse position than I could possibly begin to describe. But if you read them and you see them for what they really are, the purpose for which God gave them, oh, you're in a good place. And I would tell you, look to Jesus. Look to Christ who can wash away. Listen, I said, I said a moment ago, there's not a perfect man. There's not a man who hasn't sinned. But you know, you know that there was one. His name is Jesus. And he's different from us. He was not born naturally like you and I are. The Bible says that he was born of a virgin, that he was conceived in Mary's womb of the Holy Ghost. Therefore, he did not have that sin nature flowing through his blood like you and I have. And Jesus lived his whole life, eventually suffered, and he bled, and he died. And on the third day, the Bible says that he rose again, and he did all of that. He did all of that so that you and I could be set free. 
And listen, that is the purpose for which these commandments are given, to help us understand, I can't keep these. I, I, I'm, I'm a miserable wretch. Oh, but there's someone, his name is Jesus, who came and he fulfilled every element of this law. He lived his whole life and he never sinned, never did anything disappointing or, or, or despairing. Jesus Christ, the purpose of the law is to drive us to faith in him. Finally, number three, let me say this. As we consider, as we consider the giving of the Ten Commandments, I think what God is saying, he's making the statement, and that is this, life in Egypt Life in Egypt can never compare to the life God has designed for you to live. Life in Egypt can never compare to the life God has designed for you to live. See, for 420 years, they'd lived in bondage, and they wanted out desperately. God delivered them, and God promised them blessings for their obedience. But listen, obedience would require faith and discipline. But God says, listen, if you'll, if you'll follow me, if you'll obey me, it'll be worth it. And here's what you need to understand. You need to understand that life is hard. Have you figured that out by now? Life is hard, no matter how it's lived. No matter how, how it's lived, it's hard. I mean, bad things happen to all of us. Difficult things. You can, you can, live, you can live as spiritually as you want to live. I, you, know, you know there are people in this world who go to church every single day. Did you know that? Every day they go. They pray some prayers. Maybe they give some money. Guess what? Life is, is hard for them too. There's some, there's some people that are absolutely, absolutely rebellious in every way, haven't darkened a door of a church, maybe ever. And guess what? Life is hard for them as well. It's hard for everybody. I mean, that's just the, that's just the element of life. You, 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 you look at this and you say, well, I, 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 think I, can, I think I can live pretty close to the standard that's listed here. And, 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 and you can try it, and you'll discover, boy, that's hard to do. And you're, even, if you, even if you achieve it, Life is still going to be hard. Bad things are going to happen. It's just part of life. It's, it's how it is. In fact, the Bible, the Bible says in 2 Timothy 2, 3 that we're to endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. He doesn't say you might have to. He says you're, you're going to have to do it, therefore you might as well do it. Endure hardness as a good soldier. The life of a soldier is a hard life. It's not easy to be disciplined and live with integrity. It's hard work. To, to, to constantly put, a, put a, a watch over your lips that you not say something deceitful, that you not uh, put, a, put a watch over your eyes, that you not find yourself lusting or coveting after something that isn't yours, or, or put a watch over your temper that you do not find yourself dishonoring your parents or authority figures. It is hard work. And even if you get to a point where you're living pretty close to the standard, life's still gonna be hard. You, you should know that. But can I say this? No matter how hard life is, May you understand, listen, that life in Egypt is always harder. Life in Egypt is always harder. You see, life in Egypt was absent, these laws or commandments. These didn't come out until three months after they left Egypt. Here, here's what Egypt says. Egypt says, come on back. Come on back to where there are no laws. There are no commandments. Come on, come on back where there are no expectations. There are no responsibilities. And can I say that every last one of us that have left Egypt, God has delivered us from that place of bondage, and we found ourselves, listen, we found ourselves out here maybe living in the promised land of God's goodness or maybe even some, in some form of a wilderness setting. The, the, the cry from Egypt is always loud, and the cry is this, come on back. Come on back to the place there are no laws. There are no rules. There are no expectations. And may we never forget, may we never forget Listen, there, maybe, there's no, maybe there's no laws or there's no rules there. Oh, but listen, the hardness of life in Egypt can never be underestimated. Life in Egypt, listen, is always harder. Sometimes we, we look at the Christian life and we think, man, God has all these expectations for me. How can I ever measure? I can't measure up. It's impossible. I, 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 man, life was easier back when I didn't have any of these expectations or I didn't know what God wanted for me or how I was supposed to live. And may you never forget, listen, during those, during those days you were in bondage, you were in captivity. Sin held you captive. And hell, listen, hell was the end result. You're nothing but a slave to your sin and to your wickedness. And today, listen, today we get to be servants of the most high God. Life is hard, there's no question about it. Life in Egypt is always harder. Therefore, therefore, listen, listen. Here's, what, here's the point. The point is this, that life in Egypt can never compare to the blessings of the life God has designed for you to live. Oh, there are difficult moments. There always are gonna be difficult moments. There'll be moments in which we have to discipline ourselves, moments in which we have to say no to things. But listen, this 
is the beautiful life that God has designed for us to live. Remember these three simple thoughts. Listen, God has the authority. He has the right to not only tell you how to live, but to hold you accountable to it as well. Number two, the Ten Commandments, listen, they're not a goal for us to keep as much as they are a mirror showing us how flawed we really are and how much we need Christ. Finally, the world revels in a life with no rules, no responsibilities, no expectations, but they lose sight of the complete and total bondage they are in, including, listen, including, but definitely not limited to the eternal bondage that is waiting for them.